Bienvenidos a otro encuentro con Cartago. Bienvenidos nosotros en vuestros hogares. Nos sentimos también en este encuentro semanal de repasar una vez a la semana desde esta pequeña isla llamada así en homenaje a esa ciudad-estado que resistió el embate romano por casi un siglo. Nosotros que nos encontramos para ver cosas que están pasando en la esquina, cosas que están pasando en la patria grande y cosas que pasan en el mundo. Una mirada popular sobre esos temas. Hoy más popular que nunca vinculado a eh, un aspecto que siempre nos ha tratado eh, de alguna manera de sobrevolar, aunque sea capilarmente, pero nos metemos a veces cada vez que podemos y lo desarrollamos, que son las temáticas documentales. Dar a conocer esta infinidad, esta marea de eh, conocimiento, de retratos que hay dando vuelta en, el, en la escena del documentalismo independiente. Eso que tiene que ver con meterse con el pulso de los tiempos, con rastrear las imágenes, con este, ahondar en esas miradas perdidas que terminan de alguna manera siendo un gran escenario ignorado eh, a la vista de todos. Estamos viendo sin ser vistos, entonces nos otorga esa impunidad a la imagen que uno quisiera que en algún punto sea permanentemente algo sacralizado. Y no, estos documentaristas quiebran con esa escena y nos meten en esa realidad, ¿eh? sea el pueblo vasco, sea este, los pueblos colombianos, sea la ignorancia que nos rodea respecto de lo que está pasando en Haití o en este caso que nos vamos a meter con Palestina. Eh, cuando empezamos nuestra etapa 2012 habíamos recreado unos documentales realizados por el equipo de trabajo Betzelem que tenían que ver con los puestos de control que hay entre el ejército israelí y el pueblo palestino el maltrato, el racismo, la violencia, inculcados en jóvenes soldados que realizan sus primeras armas de motivación y de desprecio hacia el pueblo palestino, nada menos que en los puestos de control. Todo hecho por un documentalista israelí. En este caso, viene a recrearnos esa idea, este excelente trabajo que está representado en una charla íntima con uno de los autores más controvertidos y más leídos también dentro de de la intelectualidad israelí, que es Miko Peled. Miko Peled es hijo de un general muy influyente allá eh, por el 48, cuando eh, Israel da sus primeros pasos, y que forma parte también del generalato en el IDF, las, famosas, las primeras guerras de conquista que lanzó Israel eh, con, contra sus vecinos. Así que Miko Peled está criado en una familia sionista con ideales marcadamente eh, racistas que de alguna manera también tienen que ver con la excelencia que rodea, este, por lo menos en, en términos publicitarios, a mucho del pensamiento sionista incluso entre las generaciones más jóvenes dentro de Israel. Así que este testimonio es desde adentro. Él escribe un libro que es impactante que se llama El hijo del general como un sionista empieza a cuestionarse esta violencia desmedida de una superpotencia en armas, en política y en economía contra un pueblo al que le es negado incluso su derecho a ser un Estado-Nación. Ese detalle está presente en esta charla que tiene Mico Peled con la Cámara. Nosotros somos la Cámara, nosotros somos hoy el ojo eléctrico y él está relatando esta vivencia que seguramente el sionismo, si nos está viendo, va a negar automáticamente. Las críticas del sionismo siempre son bastante externalizadas, son automáticas. Pero no creo que uno no deje de estar atravesado por esta mirada por momentos muy autocrítica, por momentos muy convencida y en todo su plazo absolutamente humana que tiene Mico Peled en este retrato que nos ofrecen hoy en este documental compartido en Cartago que se llama El Hijo del General. Miko Pellet is a peace activist who dares to say in public what others still choose to deny. Born in Jerusalem in 1961 into a well-known Zionist family, his father, Matty Pallad, was a young officer in the War of 1948 and a general in the War of 1967, when Israel conquered the West Bank, Gaza, Golan Heights, and Sinai. Miko's unlikely opinions reflect his father's legacy. General Pellad was a war hero turned peacemaker. It's time to sweep away some of the myths. 
and to uncover the truth so that we can finally live in peace together. And so the three myths that I like to uncover, the three probably most popular myths, the most common myths, the myth of 1948, the myth where, well, the myth was that there was a, a, a country without a people. And then the myth of the existential threat of 1967. And then finally, the myth of the Israeli democracy. Growing up, we were taught to believe that the Arabs had left Eretz Israel, partly on their own and partly at the directive of their so-called leaders. And that therefore, taking their land and taking their homes was morally okay. It never occurred to us that even if they did leave willingly, we had no right to prohibit their return. But then, Israeli historians had found that just as Palestinians have been saying for decades, none of this was true. And it's interesting that when Palestinians claim something, <clears throat> we tend to doubt it. But then when Israeli historians come up and say the exact same thing, well then, now we accept it. As though the Palestinian word is not, is not good enough. And so Israeli historians had confirmed that Israel was created on the ruins of Palestine. Now, obviously, Palestine was not a state yet at the time. We're talking about 1948. But um, it, was, it would have been a state very shortly thereafter had it not been so completely destroyed. That had bustling cities. It had a middle class. It had trade and commerce. Palestinians had judges and scholars, and they had a rich political life, um, and um, they had all the, all, the, all the characteristics of a state to be. But the one thing in which they didn't invest, the one thing in which Palestinians did not have, was the military, any kind of militia. And so when the Jewish militias attacked, even though the Palestinians constituted the vast majority of the population, when the Jewish militias attacked, they were helpless. The, Jewish, the Jews, on the other hand, in Palestine at the time, were a minority, probably less than half a million, but they had put together uh, state-like institutions. So they had their own schools, they had their own universal health care system, for example, they had a quasi-government, of which my grandfather was a member, and all of these were created based on the principle of hafrada, which in Hebrew means segregation. In other words, to be completely separate from all the institutions that the Palestinians had had. And the one thing that they did, in which they did invest heavily was a very strong militia. A militia of young men, well indoctrinated, well trained, of which my father was a member. And they were determined to create a Jewish state in Palestine, completely disregarding the fact that the majority of the population were not Jews, but were Palestinian Arabs. It turns out that the creation of Israel had not, after all, been a haphazard fight in which the Arabs fled their homes due to the directives of their own leaders. It had been an unprovoked, systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing by the Jewish militia involving massacres, terrorism, and the wholesale looting of an entire nation. Now it's interesting, my mother was born and raised in Jerusalem. She was born in 1926. And she recalls the Palestinian neighborhoods in West Jerusalem. And when the residents of these neighborhoods were forced to leave, their homes, which are still in Jerusalem, their beautiful, spacious homes with beautiful gardens, uh, were offered to Jewish families and one such home was offered to her, being the wife of, a, of an officer and so forth. And she refused it. She said she could not bring herself to move into the home of a family that had been forced out and is now living in a refugee camp. She also said, and I heard this confirmed by many people, that when the Jewish forces came into the homes, the coffee was still warm on the table. The people had just left. And then the looting began. And again, she recalls seeing the truckloads of furniture and rugs and what have you being taken away 
from those homes. Another widely accepted Zionist myth is that in 1967, Israel faced an existential threat where um, the armies of three Arab countries were invading and miraculously the Jewish forces were able to beat them all and conquer huge, huge, huge tracts of land. Now, setting aside for a moment the fact that endless, countless books have been written in Hebrew and English and Arabic and other languages and that um, documentaries have been filmed disproving this completely and showing that the purpose of the war was conquest. In my own research, in my own research in pre preparation for this book, I went, I spent days at the Israeli Army Archives and I read from the minutes of the meetings of the Israeli General Staff, the top IDF, top brass, and the things that were said uh, during those meetings. And I want again, I want to quote from my book um, one such passage. In a stormy meeting of the IDF top brass in the Israeli cabinet that took place on the 2nd of June, 1967, my father, General Mati Pele, told the cabinet in no uncertain terms that the Egyptians needed at least a year and a half in order to be prepared for a full-scale war. His point was that the time to strike a devastating blow against the Egyptian army was now not because of an existential threat, but because the Egyptian army was not prepared and it was an opportunity to destroy it once again. The other generals agreed, but the cabinet was hes hesitant. The prime minister was not sure a full-scale war was the right thing to do, and a tug of war of unimaginable proportions ensued. During that same stormy meeting, my father said to the Prime Minister, President Nasser, referring to Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, President Nasser is advancing an ill-prepared army because he is counting on the cabinet being hesitant. He's convinced that we will not strike your hesitation is working to his advantage. Later on, he accused the Prime Minister of insulting the army, this army that had never lost in battle, by not allowing the army to attack right now. So there was never any mention of an existential threat, just an opportunity to once again assert Israeli strength. In the end, the cabinet succumbed to the enormous pressure placed upon them by the general, and they, um, and they decided on a preemptive strike that began on, the June, on June the 5th, 1967. And again, I want to quote from my book. The surprise attack led to the total destruction of, the, of Egypt's air force, the decimation of the Egyptian army, and the reconquest of the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula in a matter of days. The Israeli army also knew that the Syrian army was in shambles and the Jordanians were no match for the IDF strength. After the campaign of Egypt went so smoothly, the generals turned their attention to the West Bank and the Golan Heights, two regions that Israel had coveted for many years. Both regions had strategic water resources and hills overlooking Israeli territory. And the West Bank contained the heartland of, Israel, of biblical Israel and the crown jewel, the old city of Jerusalem. In six days, it was all over. Arab casualties were estimated at 15,000. That's 15,000 dead in six days. Israeli casualties were 700. And the territory controlled by Israel had nearly tripled in size. Israel had in its possession not only the land and resources it had wanted for a long time, but also the largest stockpiles of Russian-made arms outside of Russia. Israel had once again asserted itself as a major regional power or as the neighborhood bully 